I'm Margaret Jefferson, and welcome to this quest of a panel. Can a feminist classic be an American classic? Um, practicalities first, I will give you um, the trio of bios in just a minute. And if I cut a bit, um, our panelists will understand that, and you too, that there are very complete bios in the program. Um, first, a parenthetical correction. Um, just because journalists tend to are often dishonest, and I want to be an honest one. Um, <laughs> I left the staff of the New York Times a few years ago, so that's a correction in my bio. Uh, now, just a few words about this title question. Uh, of course you've noticed the other questions that are reverberating um, in, around and beneath the title. Um, they might even be tension agitating. Are secure enough to doff our hats at Edgar Allan Poe. Um, so, what is a classic, and what's an American? Um, you know, there was a lot knocking around between and beneath those hyphens. Uh, how do we define a feminist American classic? And what about we? Who and what are we in relation to each other and to ourselves? Uh, does feminism include categories like girl stories, chick lit, weepers? And I think now we're so aware of how feminisms are multiplying that all those differences between us that in the you know, 50s ladylike genteel language were called differences of background, um, you know, are now things we really think of in terms of history and experience and difference, um, again, um, amongst ourselves. And those big obdurate terms like class, race, ethnicity, religion, gender and sexuality contain multitudes. A lot of people spoke this morning about the shock, um, if you were of that, the, the fear of flying, the Erica Jong generation, and grew up largely reading uh, men, or if you were training in terms of your formal literary training, and often largely being taught by men, um, the thrill of re rescuing, of discovering, of finding all of these books after years or centuries of benign and malign neglect and contempt and disdain and patronization. Uh, there is one thing, though, that I've come to believe is a great, uh, a, a, dis a use very useful discipline that came from that kind of education, and it's that we had to learn if we loved literature and the imagination. We all had to learn to imagine what had not made room to imagine us um, at all. And it turns out that that's um, a great discipline. Um, it imposes a lot of pressure, but as one of my heroes still, Billie Jean King says, pressure is a privilege. And I think that now, particularly, as feminism and feminisms and our our realities and minds and hearts um, are so complex. It's a very, very um, great thing that we are aware, um, you know, here we are, aware even, you know, um, together amongst ourselves that, um, you know, trying to imagine, to reimagine um, ourselves through something that seems alien, to efface ourselves and, and, and imagine when we pick up a book by another woman, something else entirely. Uh, this is what we need as we make our way through this growing body of ephemeral, controversial, canonical, whatever, um, of writing by women in the world. So without further ado, I'm going from right to left. Uh, Min Jin Lee went to Yale College, then to law school at Georgetown University, and despite having won awards for writing as an undergrad, uh, worked as a lawyer for several years before writing full-time. She's received many writing awards, including the NYFA Fellowship for Fiction, Nar and the Narrative Prize for New and Emerging Writers. You have probably heard her, Fiction Read, on NPR Selected Shorts, and hopefully you will have read her terrific best-selling first novel, Free Food for Million Eggs, which among other things was a New York <coughs> Times, Wall Street Editor's Choice of the Year, and a top 10 novels of the year pick 
The Times of London and USA Today. She now lives in Tokyo with her husband and son, and she's working on a second novel, A Change Book. Rebecca Traster, if you read um, Salon.com, then you know her work. She, before going to Salon, she spent four years at the New York Observer covering the film business and then moved to Salon where she spent the last four years, um, bless her heart, writing about women in media, politics, and entertainment. She helped launch Broadsheet, Salon's Daily, and Feminist Women's Blog. And she's written for Elle, Vogue, The New York Times, and New York Magazine. And finally, uh, Nancy K. Miller, distinguished professor of English and Comparative Lit at the Graduate Center of CUNY. Uh, her title, this title, represents the end point of an academic journey from the French department across the way at Columbia to women's studies at Barnard to English at Lehman College at the Graduate Center, and since 1999, English and conflict at the Graduate Center. The subjects of her book follow this trajectory, from the heroine's text, readings into French and English novel, subject to, subject to change, reading feminist writing, and the edited poetics of gender, to her most recent books, but enough about me. Uh, <laughs> but enough about me, why we read, how I lost my second why we read dot 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 other people's you. lives. <laughs> is there an other? No, it isn't. No, you're right. You're right. Yeah, other right. people's. Yes. Um, and the co-edited collection of another um, strong title, Extremities, Trauma, Testimony, and Community. Um, and so, let's go. Less than two years ago, I had on my desk a 700 page manuscript in a King Coat box. I did not have an agent, and I had been working on fiction for 12 years. And the fact that I am here today to talk about Erica Jean's book with these luminaries is quite an amazing thing. If you guys would like to call my mother <laughs> and let her know, <laughs> perhaps I have really arrived in the world. <laughs> That'd be great. I can send you her number. Good afternoon, and thank you, Margot, for that terrific introduction. And um, I'd like to thank Professor Marianne Hirsch, I don't know where she is. Oh, hello. <laughs> and Michael Ryan for conceiving and organizing this incredible day. And I feel really honored to be included in this panel in particular. And as I was sort of gushing before, these are women I regularly read and admire. And to be sitting at this table with them is really an amazing thing for me. So uh, just thank you for including me. Can a feminist classic be an American classic? Is an inquiry, among other things, about legacy and the acceptance of culture and its feelings about accepting in its culture. Erica Jean writes in her memoir, Seducing the Demon, that the fear of flying was published in a time when everyone was interested in women writers, including poets. I graduated from college in 1990 when it seemed that all creative works by women, minorities, and the gay community were considered suspect from the starting date. Books such as Dinesh D'Souza's A Liberal Education was published in 1991 to great critical acclaim. Shelby Steele's The Content of Our Character was published in 1990, and which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. And I recall distinctly how the phrase political correctness was the fastest way to make any idea intellectually embarrassing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was actually in the New York Times yesterday when I saw this happen, when there's an article about vegan strip clubs. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> I won't um, honor that article any more than I need to. In 2008, we live in a time when young women 
would prefer to be a contestant on American Idol rather than be a member of Congress. Where Michelle Obama, a contender for first lady, is criticized by female columnists of the most powerful newspaper in America to tone down her sarcasm to help her husband win. And where Senator Hillary Clinton, a former first lady running for president, is openly hated by half of her own party, many of them women. Our world continues to ask women to be ornamental and sad. So are these young women foolish to want to sing pop songs in front of mean-spirited judges instead of making election speeches? I'm afraid that I believe that we are living in a time that is far more suspicious of works by women, people of color, and gays. One or two works do enter the canon, but the remain remainder are dismissed or marginalized at best. The justification for this comes interestingly from this idea that this era, today, 2008, is post-feminist, post-civil rights, and post-modern, or post-postmodern. There are smarter people um, in this room than me who can explain that. What are you whining about is the reply of not just the conservative, but of mainstream people. We have supposedly arrived, and we have passed beyond the point when the stories of historical outsiders need to be examined or encouraged. What is considered intelligent in the media today are The Daily Show, The Colbert Report, Borat, and politically incorrect. Formats from both sides of the political spectrum which offer irony, sarcasm, and light satire as a mirror of our world. These formats routinely, routinely mock feminism and women. I am sad to say that this open hostility toward feminism may bar the entry of feminist classics into the canon of American classics. But what about the fear of wine? What is remarkable about this book, this very seminal book which has influenced me profoundly and has given me enormous freedom and latitude to write fiction, is how it has distinguished itself from other seminal and brilliant feminist classic by how it has affected culture. I went to the Bronx High School of Science and English is actually my second language. And though I know that the word culture meant a kind of social and intellectual formation, I also understood from my biology class that culture was found in a petri dish <laughs> in the form of agar. And this kind of culture was a nutrient medium for new life. Fear of flying has long been a nutrient medium to breed other forms of new art by being a very specific kind of novel. The vagina monologues, the advent and growth of narrative nonfiction, the richer and more honest examination of women's true needs in fiction have been nourished by the fear of lines, plot, imagery, diction, tone, its brave point of view, and aesthetic design. As a Bildungsroman, a coming of age novel, Fear of Flying is also a subset of that genre by being a Kunstlerroman, a novel about the formation of being an artist, of becoming an artist. We have examples of the Kunstlerroman for women in the contemporary novel, yet nothing that I can recall has had this level of popular reach in the imagination. And I actually think it's this uniqueness that has made this book especially important. Fear of Flying is a story of a young poet who is attempting to make sense of not just her life, but of what life should be in general. <clears throat> Isadora Wayne is a poet who is doing what poets do. She's having an existential crisis. <laughs> She's acting out. As a satire, it goes beyond its traditional definition of exposing social flaws by giving us a heroine who notices the hypocrisy of society and herself. And 
in the face of her conflicts, Isadora continues to love. And she continues to laugh. And she continues to fall down. And she gets up again. And in her journey, which takes the term of a woman's menstrual cycle, where she begins as a young woman, but she ends up in diapers, the midwife of her own birth, the author allegorizes the birth of an artist. Elaine Showalter writes in her essay, I have to stop here for a second because Elaine Showalter was commenting earlier and I was thinking, she's actually here. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> Helene Showalter writes in her essay, The Death of Lily Bart, paren, novelist, close paren, about Edith Wharton's The House of Myrrh, that Wharton kills the protagonist of Lily Bart in order to kill the notion of the lady and to give birth to the notion of the solidarity of working women, as well as to give birth to Wharton's own maturation as a novelist. This is a really elegant interpretation to the difficult problem of women who die to atone for their sins. I also think Erica Jean's solution of letting Isadora live while killing off the chaste good girl and any residual cult of domesticity through its narrative structure as a radical moment in literature. I believe New York Times has become an American classic, also because it is a novel which negotiates the feminist's righteous anger in a clever, and I want to say, a very subversive way, through Isadora's own depression, acting out, male adoration, and self-deprecating humor. Men, traditional gatekeepers, have very good reason to like this book because even though they are portrayed as flawed, they are also profoundly loved. I began this very brief talk by painting a rather grim portrait of where we stand. But the fact is that the fear of flying is an American classic. When there are such great forces which prevent the art of true genius feminists from entering the canon, attests to the inherent excellence and originality of this work. The rarity of such a claim, perhaps, is its own compliment, and confirms just how much the book deserves a day like today. And I wish it many more. Thank you. Tennis 
for the author's actual husband, who might already have been an ex at the time. <laughs> I don't recall the chronology of John's biography. What can I say? I identified, except for not being blonde, which is an important enough difference, especially for a Jewish girl growing up in the 1950s. <laughs> not long after the novel appeared, I was invited to speak at a conference on gender and myth at Union College, a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. I decided I would talk about Homer's Odyssey and, and John's fear of flying. By then, I had happily taken the path of heroin an author had rejected. I was becoming an academic, not a writer. It was the height of what came to be called French feminism, and I had started teaching French, along with Susan Suleiman, at Columbia College. I was also teaching the course popularly known as Lit Hum, Masterpieces of European Literature and Philosophy, the required course in great literature that begins with the Greeks and Romans and ends with Dostoevsky or maybe Kafka. It's now called Masterpieces of Western Literature and Philosophy, but the major players haven't changed. Back to Union College. What did gender have to do with Homer's epic? Not just Odysseus dallying with Circe or the Song of the Sirens, but the kind of gender reversal that fascinated us at the time. French feminist Hélène Sixou, for instance, claimed that the sirens were men. Heroines of antiquity mainly stayed home and were faithful to their husbands, Hecuba, Penelope, unless, like Helen, they were abducted into sexuality. Of course, I'm leaving out a few major exceptions of less husband-friendly heroines, of course, like Clytemnestra or Medea. <laughs> what I wondered with the students at Union College would John's novel look like if we read it as a revision of that epic of male adventure. Fear of flying made the question unavoidable. Come with me, shrink lover, Adrian Goodlove suggests, as he tries to lure the heroine away from her also shrink husband and travel with him on the road. <coughs> we'll have a great time, an odyssey. Let's return to Born in Columbia, a decade after Fear of Flying. In the fall of 1983, Columbia admitted women to its previously all-male college. The presence of female undergraduates led a few forward-looking faculty on the Columbia campus to wonder whether some changes to the required core curriculum might not be in order. A few years later, in 1986, the headline in the campus newspaper, Spectator, announced, Jane Austen now required in spring lit hum syllabus. True. <laughs> and the opening paragraph reads: Co-education will take on a new meaning this spring as Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice becomes required reading for Columbia's Columbia College's humanities course. A senior professor in the English department is quoted as having admitted that some members of the faculty felt that Austen's work was not relevant to the rest of the syllabus, but also said that her significance as a respected woman author was more important than the work's ability to stand up by itself. <laughs> a further objection to Austen's inclusion was that Pride and Prejudice didn't have obvious connections to earlier classical works, the true criteria. As we make our way into the 21st century, Austin is still on the syllabus, and so I'm happy to say it's a wolf with to the lighthouse. But let me reverse chronology one more time and travel back to 1973 and the publication of Fear of Flying. It's the 70s. In 1970, Anne Coit publishes her manifesto, The Myth of the Vaginal Orgasm. Kate Millett publishes her Columbia dissertation as a book, Sexual Politics, and makes the cover of Time magazine. Women are marching in the streets for equality. Jermaine Greer makes headlines with a female eunuch. Black's novel, The Bell Jar, is republished in its American edition. Alex Kate Shulman has huge success with her best-selling novel, Memoirs of the Next Prom Queen. Feisty and sexy, sexy heroines are bursting out onto the scene. Multiple orgasms are being counted. Husbands discarded, lovers added. The mood and the times are ripe for a book like Fear of Flying that takes the notion of sexual freedom to a new stage of explicitness. Henry Miller just declares himself John's devoted fan <coughs> to the of the New York Times. John returns a compliment in a twin column. John Updike showers the novel with enthusiastic praise in a long review in the New Yorker. Thirty-five years later, Fear of Flying is still in print. Most would agree that the novel is a feminist classic. Does that make it a classic? How can we think about these categories and what constitutes them? Well, here's one way. 
In Why Read the Classics, the Italian writer Italo Calvino offers a 14-point definition of what a classic is. The first is, classics are books of which we usually hear people say, I am rereading. I never, I am reading. <laughs> Young people are exempt from this category since this would be the first time they could be reading a classic. <laughs> Most women readers, including myself, who were alive and sentient in 1973, will be rereading Fear of Flying, as I did this month for this conference, and also for the course I'm teaching with Marianne Hirsch on novels and feminist literary history that we cheerfully call Heroines of Disaster. <laughs> we, we, we began with Madame Bovary and Anna Karenina. When I read Fear of Flying in the 1970s, I was myself in pursuit of the zipless fuck. I identified with this odyssey of a literary girl hoping for her life to live up to the literature she adored and that had shaped her vision of the world. The book is in many ways, and this is what I think we're hearing today, the narrative of a generation of girls who grew up in the 1950s and stepped into the 1960s somewhat underprepared for the changing rules of the game, the game we were actually trying to change without truly understanding its politics. I was astonished that Erica John had written so much of my life, read so many of the same books, and seen the same movies. But this time, I was rereading the novel not for myself, but for, as it were, the students in the seminar. How I wonder, thinking about them, will Isadora Wing appear to students who have just read Freud's famous Dora case, as well as Aden Sixu's feminist manifesto, The Last of the Medusa, takes Freud to task for his ideas about femininity and makes much of the word flying, flade, which in French can mean both to fly and to steal, to steal the language. Here, Calvino's point 11 applies. Your classic author is the one you cannot feel indifferent to, who helps you to define yourself in relation to him, even in dispute with him. The students did just that, to find themselves in relation and sometimes in disagreement. And here I should say that we have a blog, so I'm just going to be quoting from the student blog. One student wrote, what I see in the lives of, of the women around me is the choice or non-choice of being alone. Another on the same theme as a reader, roughly Isadora's age, I can't help feeling frustrated that I'm still chipping away at the very beliefs that Isadora was chipping away at. How can a woman live alone in a dignified way? Another sound a similar note. As a daughter of second wave feminism, I can read fear of flying with the frustration of wanting to point Isadora beyond the binary of man number one or man number two to the obvious, to me, choice to fly solo for a while. In a different direction, one of the students addressed the mother-daughter plot that has been a major thread in the seminar. I identified, she says, most with Isadora's issues around pregnancy and the complicated layers of fantasy, desire, violence, history, and terror involved with that. That seems very real and very now, at least to me. So where does this leave us in terms of our question about feminist classics? How long does it take for something new, something now, to enter literary history? In his 1963 manifesto for a new novel, French novelist, the late Alain Robrier, sounds a bit like Virginia Woolf when he talks about what it means to write a new novel, starting with 1910. Lobert was writing the new novel of 1860, Proust of 1910. The writer must accept to bear his date, knowing that there are no masterpieces in, etern in eternity, only works in history, and that they survive only to the extent that they have left the past behind and announced the future. Certainly, in that sense, the, bear, the book bears its date, the novel was immediately seen as being of its time, excerpted in the newly created Ms. Magazine, The New Feminist Standard. Comparisons were made to Lolita and Portnoy's complaints, scandalous novels of recent history, already seen at that time as destined to be classics of the, the American experience. But at the same time, John's novel was doing something else, as several people have already noted, perhaps less immediately obvious leaving the past of male wanderers and dead heroines behind and announcing the future of female survival after sexual experience, announcing the kind of life story that had not yet been given a recognizable plot. No, you don't have to die of love or shame or badness or credit card debt, which is how we finally explain Madame Bovary's problems. <laughs> as, as, as one of the seminar students observed, 
It's a conscious rewriting of the Harrison disaster plot, Anna Karenina's and Emma, Emma Goldberg's in particular. Can a book be of its time also be for all time, even if, even if as Hubbard Gay put it, sounding again like Virginia Woolf, there are no masterpieces in eternity? Narrowing the question somewhat, I want to wonder with you in closing whether, particularly in America, where we have no Jane Austen clause, a feminist classic ever will be considered a classic. American feminist classics like The Awakening or The Yellow Wallpaper or Their Eyes Were Watching God are not generally considered to be classics except by feminists and the occasional outlier man. <laughs> On the whole, our national traditions tend not to cross gender lines. Now, I have a couple of just one second. <clears throat> John Updike's New Yorker review, and obviously from the attention we've all given it, we all know that it's a big deal to get a, a New Yorker review from John Updike. But I want to put some part of it that wasn't, I think, um, mentioned yet. Uh, okay, he wrote in uh, 1973 uh, as an, a kind of exception to this rule of gender separation. Here are flying, he wrote, while a luxuriant bloom in the sometimes thistly garden of raised feminine consciousness <laughs> also belongs to this part we did here and hilarious extent, it hilariously extends the tradition of Catcher in the Rye and Portnoy's complaint. Few anthologies and literary histories follow his lead. The explanations of this divide reside in Updike's metaphors, the thistle problem, we might call it. <laughs> which means that women's experience, in particular women's experience of sexuality as represented through the vision of women writers, does not correspond to the norms of universal experience that the classic is thought to convey by those that seek to construct and protect the canon. But should we despair, here is where we might make a distinction between canon and classic that I have neatly skipped over. Although institutions like Columbia may successfully, like Bull's Beetle, famous Beetle, and ruling one's own, maintain <coughs> definitions of what should and should not pass through its gates, the classic actually eludes those restrictions. As my husband's seventh grade teacher in Alabama explained to her pupils when they had to read something old, a classic, she said, is a work that has stood the test of time. Or if you prefer more pedigree, as Nobel laureate J.M. Kotsia concluded at the end of What is a Classic? So we arrive at a certain paradox. The classic defines itself by surviving. In other words, in the end, the feminist classic, too, may ultimately become a classic through its very act of survival. Recognized classics say something old extremely well. Feminist classics say something new. And we have to wait to know just how well they will have said it. That's the test of the future perfect. Thank you. It's been a question that has perplexed me, in part because I found myself really wondering, this is a strange thing to wonder as somebody who spends her days writing about feminism, but I found myself wondering, what the hell is a feminist classic? <laughs> there are obvious answers. A lot of them have been mentioned already. There's Audrey Rich, Virginia Woolf, Kate Chopin. Those are the ones that came to me as your standard feminist classic. Truth is, I didn't get to a lot of those. I, I shall replace myself. I was born two years after Fear of Flying. I'm 30, I'll turn 32 next month. I didn't get to a lot of those writers until I was already in college, in women's studies classes, looking at them through a feminist lens. But the truth is that I think that my feminism had already been built or begun to be built long before I got to college and wanted to take a women's studies class. And it wasn't built in my life in a comfortable, suburban, post-feminist home <coughs> alone. It was built by the fictions that I was reading. And so I began to think about what kinds of fictions I was reading. The books that I was reading graciously, I did not connect to my idea of what feminism was. As I said, I grew up in a, fem in a household where the word feminism was used, where I would have called myself a feminist. What that meant was that I got on a bus to Washington and marched in a reproductive rights March, I knew that I wanted to protect abortion rights. I mean, I knew that when I was a child, when I was a teenager, but I didn't connect that to the books that I was reading like crazy, staying up with flashlights. But the books that I was reading were helping me build my ideas of gender and power and race and class. They were in many ways, in
in many, many ways, teaching me what it means and what it has meant historically and imaginatively to be female. So I began to think about the books that I gobbled. In childhood, and, and Margo and I talked a little bit about this over email, there was Little Women. There was Little House on the Prairie and Little House on the, in the Big Woods, all the bigger little females. <laughs> <laughs> There was To Kill a Mockingbird and A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. From Jane Austen and Edith Wharton, I learned about the economic and social constraints faced by women. From Nancy Drew, I learned about solving mysteries. <laughs> From Maya Tania and Their Eyes Were Watching God and Jane Eyre, I learned about love and impossibility. From Auntie Maine, <laughs> I learned about female eccentricity and all the possibilities that went with that. From Judy Bloom, I learned about periods and a little bit about sex and boys and religion and family. But I was completely unconscious of the way that I was absorbing all of this information that, that I would later understand, that I understand now to be fundamental building blocks to my sense of what feminism means, to my sense of myself as a feminist and as a woman. I actually picked up Sula, and there's some embarrassing truth that I'm about to reveal here. <laughs> I picked up Sula sometime in high school because I was putting together one of those books, and maybe hopefully there are other women who went through phases like this. Um, one of those books of really attractive quotations that really sum up friendship, love, and high school life that you might give to your friends or write in your book. <laughs> and I read the back of Sula and thought, oh, there might be a great quotation about friendship in here. <laughs> And that's how I came to that book. <laughs> Some of the books that I read that were feminist, I mean, what we would all consider feminist classics, I picked up merely because they were sitting around the house. The Woman Warrior. Or The Handmaid's Tale, which I confess I read when I was 11 years old, on vacation. I remember my aunt, who's a feminist and a professor of English at Columbia, and she's not here today. But I was on vacation with her, and I remember her coming to me, I was reading it in a hammock, and she said, what are you reading? I was 11, and I showed her. And I remember the, watching her thought process, that she was clearly concerned. <laughs> and then I watched it go through her head. And she went, OK, <laughs> and walked away. But I will tell you that what a handmaid's tale looks like to an 11-year-old is science fiction. I might as well have been reading Robert Heinlein. And I will also tell you another embarrassing confession, that the detail that I must remember from A Handmaid's Tale is that when deprived of cosmetic potions, you can use butter as a moisturizer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I was absorbing from these books and was so deeply unconscious that sitting in a class in my high school probably in the 10th grade, uh, talking about Jane Eyre. This is what I was just saying um, to somebody who, who taught in my high school. Um, that it was my first memory of hearing this phrase. A classmate of, us, of mine raised her hand, probably in reference to having a woman trapped in an attic, and said, <laughs> I'm not a feminist, but. <laughs> and that was, A, the first time I ever heard that phrase, which I would hear hundreds and thousands of times since. Um, but it was also actually a moment in which I thought, oh, I, I guess there's feminism in this, too, if we're talking about this. I guess the feminism that I exercise by going to Washington has a place while I'm reading Jane Eyre. But that's sort of how wide I, I was about it. Um, I'll also say that I'm so unconscious <laughs> that I was sitting here today listening to people and, and thinking about how Isadora had grown up reading only men, that I sat here looking at my notes and looking at my list of books and thought, I only read women. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I write about feminism for a living every day, <laughs> and this had not occurred to me that I, that I grew up 
venture out because I did not pick it up because it was a feminist book. <laughs> I read it because it was a dirty book. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> but one of the things that I thought about as I sort of put together these pieces of how I formed my vision of feminist fiction is that about 10 years later, I picked up Fear of Flying again. And at this point, I was, in, I was in my late 20s, and I had been through the women's studies courses, and I now called myself a feminist, and I had read Judy Butler, and I had read Helene Sisu, and I had read Elaine Showalter, and I had read many people in this room. And uh, I was going through, I think, a natural and healthy stage of being a daughter, in which I was experimenting with extreme scorn for all the signifiers of my mother's generation of feminism. <laughs> and when I read it in my, in my late 20s, and I read it as a feminist text, rather than as a dirty book, a good dirty book, <laughs> um, I think that there was an element that, that, that many of us in this room would, would recognize for me, you know, eight years ago or something, um, where I thought, oh yeah, we're over this now. We're over this now. This is, you know, I was not, a, I have not ever identified as a third wave feminist, um, but there was something in my, in my later reading of it when I approached it as a feminist text that, that made me think, oh, we've done this. We don't need this anymore. Have you, you know, this, we, we talk in this language very comfortably now. <clears throat> and then I read it again this month, as many people have said, for this conference. Um, <laughs> And I've now been writing about feminism full time for four years. And I have been thinking a lot in recent months about the shifting ways in which we're looking at second wave feminism in particular. And this election season certainly has brought us all different shades <laughs> of, of ways to approach second wave feminism. And I had one of those moments of re-embrace. No, we're not over this. We're really not over this. Um, this is still radical. This is more radical than it should be. Um, and this in turn made me think about the difference between reading Fear of Flying and reading these other books that I've listed. One of them, one of the differences, is that as a product of a moment and a movement that is still very recent, a book like Pure Flying is subject to the kind of buffeting of rejection and re-embrace and rejection and re-embrace that the movement itself is. And I think that it's very difficult for us to think about how will it become a classic. This is what, what Nancy was talking about to a large extent. How, how do we predict whether it will become a classic? Because I think really, I mean, there are good indications that it will. Like that we're all sitting here in this room talking about it right now. But I think that the emotions about the movement that helped to produce it run still so high, um, and in many senses are, are still so violent, that it is very difficult for us to separate our feelings about the book from our feelings about the movement. Um, and I think that it's very likely that it's not until second wave feminists and their daughters and their granddaughters are long gone that we'll be able that readers will be able to fully form that separation and maybe look at the text as simply the story of a woman of her time. And it will always still be a dirty book. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we got time, happy to say, for questions. Um, so I think it's the same format. Um, microphones will go around. Um, well, here's to thistles and passion flowers and all sorts of things. That was just fabulous, you three. Um, jump in. <laughs> uh, 
Um, my name is Barbara Jones. I, I, I mean, this is almost a rhetorical question, but why do we have to wait for this to stand the test of time when, say, Port Noise Complaint didn't have to stand the test of time? Well, I'd like to hear your... <coughs> on the panel believe that it is actually a classic today and that's my argument my problem is that there aren't more classics that I admire which have made it across the gate and that's to me the tragedy but actually I think that it is a, um, and I think really for me what made it a classic is this whole notion of the Kunstler Roman and I'm sorry that I'm bandying about this German word <coughs> but <laughs> I think to have a piece of literature that has the, uh, the formation process of an artist is really what distinguishes this book. And I think it's like The Song of the Lark, Willa Cather, which I believe is a classic, and for another reason. And I think Edith Wharton's book, uh, The House of Mirth, under Showalter's analysis, really shows why that made it a classic. So for me, it, be, it is a classic, and I don't think we have to wait. I really wish that there are other books that I admire of the same era which did work out. However, I do think that Bell Jar made it, made it across. I don't think that uh, Memoirs of an Ex-Prom Queen made it across in terms of a classic. It's a feminist classic, and I'm sorry about that. And Women's Room by Marilyn French is another one. It's a fem And actually, I believe that Marilyn French's The Women's Room is considered the last international bestseller that was a feminist classic, and that book came out, I believe, a year after Fear of Flying. However, that's not considered a classic. Again, that's relegated to feminist classic. So I agree with you. I think Portnoy's complaint is a classic period. And I'm going to argue that Fear of Flying is a classic period, too. Um, I would also say uh, that there are a lot of classics by male authors that were published in the 70s and the 80s that got instant classic status and probably won't stand the test of time. <laughs> I'm not saying that's true of Portnoy's complaint, but I do think that there are a, a number of novels by the big, I, I always think of that headline, The Twilight of the Phallocrats, by the bigger phallocrats, right? <laughs> by, by Mailer and Ross. There, there are lots of those books that we just, because they were written by men, they got to be classics before they actually became classics. So I, I think that's another aspect, that a lot of the books that we assume we'll be reading forever we won't be. So. I think it's partly the thistle of feminism again. Um, any kind of literature that gets the label um, always from the dominant reviewing group that considers itself above such things, that gets the label ideological, uh, <laughs> putting politics, a political agenda before aesthetics, which of course are defined by the same people, those are the books that have to wait. Those are the books that, as um, was said, get buffeted you know, back and forth, as, as Rebecca said, by changing opinions or don't make it across. I, I, I think this whole idea of making it across is really interesting. And, and I was wondering if we could examine it, because when, when we asked, the, and I have to thank Nancy Miller for helping me formulate this, you know, the question, can a feminist classic be? First we had an American classic, and then we thought, maybe just say a classic, because that will give us more leeway. And you know, we had sent you various versions of this. But sometimes you ask a question like that not to get a yes or no answer, but really to try to examine the question itself. And I will, you know, we need to turn it back on Ford Noise Complaint and some of the other books that we're just sort of taking for granted and, and sort of see what, you know, what, um, Goes in, what thinking goes into that question, and then maybe examine the question itself. Um, and I think going at it through what we read as children or what's on the syllabus uh, of a lit hum class, I mean, is a very good way because those are the kinds of gatekeeping mechanisms that, that we're a part of. And, you know, we might also think one of my students is actually writing a master's thesis. She's here on fear of flying, and she argues that. Um, you know, it had serious academic attention, but when, it, when a book becomes popular, then, you know, academics are a little bit more shy about paying attention to it because maybe it's not uh, highbrow enough. And so there, there's so many different kinds of questions that go into that. And I think we need to just examine the question itself. And we put it out there really to say, is this even a legitimate question? Uh, I, 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 well, it, uh, I'm 
so glad that you are now telling me that I didn't have to try to answer the question. <laughs> I, I, you know, I just was like, so what is the answer? Uh, that's why I was never really good at philosophy. I never really understood that it was just the journey. Uh, in, in any event, but the, this, I think that the question um, has almost, has been, a lot has been touched on, and um, partly the question of, Portnoy, now I have to make a really horrible confession, which is that my husband who gave me the anecdote about his, al his teacher, which I thought was sort of funny, but um, he like always teaches Portnoy's complaint, and in a course called Sin and Sex at <coughs> the State University. And I once did try to teach Portnoy's complaint in a <coughs> class on um, ethnic writing, and I truthfully could not make myself get through it. Um, it's the other side of the thistle problem, um, and I think maybe if we're going to follow out Marianne's question, we could think about why is it so actually sort of a Gloria Steinem kind of move, you know, displace the question. Why is it that Philip Roth can talk about prostate, adult diapers, and so on, and nobody blinks. Uh, and I have said to my students, try to imagine any woman writer we can think of who could, who would have, con well, she wouldn't have a prostate problem, but you know, some, some other, you know, a hysterectomy novel or something. And you can imagine the way that such a book would be received. So the question really has a lot to do with the assumption of what is universal experience, which is usually what we think of as a classic doing. And the resistance in this country, more than others, and, um, and they're, they're the English, you know, the, the Brits are just so much, you know, have a much better um, situation that there is still tremendous assumption about um, male experience being experience and everything else being exceptional. And then it leads to things that Mian was talking about, about your whining if you happen to mention how it is that you are not the, the universal and so on and so forth. There's also, um, and I think, I feel like saying uh, something that may, might not sound too attractive, um, also, uh, having to do with Roth and his reputation. And it's something that was just raised, and it has to do with the reign of the big Jews. I say this as a Jew, in the sense of who gets to decide, you know, what is a public intellectual, what are the important books, what are the important books about Jewish experience. If you ever want to get really depressed, you look at what is considered to be, you know, the, the tradition of Jewish writing. Uh, Marianne and I have talked about this a lot in relation to Grace Paley. Uh, and if you think about Grace Paley's reputation in relation to Philip Roth, and partly it's a genre question, she didn't write a novel and so on. But it's just partially that in, in American culture, the, there has, there's this also this sort of sidebar about certain kinds of um, um, accepted versions of subjects that feminists also touch on. That's the thing. In other words, that certain versions of sexuality, I mean, it's, it's hilarious if a man masturbates into a piece of, uh, what is it, liver. Uh, I don't know how hilarious that really is. Um, so, you know, or that the idea of childhood that, that uh, Catcher in the Rye, which, you know, that Catcher in the Rye is the experience, the New York, the smart kid growing up in New York, the hip, cool, adolescent novel, um, and that everything else is seen as an imitation. I mean, the bell jar is seen as an imitation of Salinger. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a... So, really, what I do think, it's a sickness in American culture that it has to do with the universal and whose experience counts, and that it's supported by a gigantic media uh, and academic institution. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, 
I just wanted to add something about that, about the expectation of what's universal and for readers. I mean, the reason that it's so hilarious that the guy jacks off into the liver is because there's, it's as if there's an assumption that the readership is male. And in fact, we haven't talked a lot about chiclet, but if you, if you talk about modern fiction and who's reading modern fiction, it's women. You could write as many gross details about female life as possible, and that's who your readership is. And so, and I don't think that chiclet as a genre, of course there are lots of very good and very bad things to say about chiclet, including an exploration of why we call it chiclet. Um, <laughs> but it's one of the things that, that female writers could really take advantage of. Women are the only people who are reading fiction. Why aren't we writing about all the, I mean, and, and some people are, why, you know, <laughs> exactly. But this is, this is something that we still consider the male experience, the universal experience, actually in no way reflects the, the publishing industry and the way that we read in this country. So, that's my And that's why you all have to read Min's novel, which is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, I'm Victoria Rosner, and I wanted to pick up on a point that Nancy was making. <laughs> I'm just, I'm troubled in some ways when I reflect on um, the place of feminist classics in the British tradition versus the American. You're going back to as far as Julian of Norwich, Marjorie Kemp, you know, Jane Austen, Mary Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft. Um, it's such a vivid tradition, and there is no question about those feminist classics being British classics. What is it, if there is something, about the American tradition and its perhaps its muscularity or its focus on quest stories um, and male proving grounds that has trouble in you know taking in feminist works? I just want to add you know, <laughs> a, a kind of an, an addendum to this discussion, but I want to take it in another direction. Which is, you know, it seems to me, though I don't disagree with anything that, that, that people have said generally, but I, I also feel that when you talk about why a novel like Fear of Flying vis-a-vis -a, -vis a novel like Portnoy's Complaint doesn't get the recognition it deserves, I think that some of the responsibility has to be assumed by feminist criticism itself and by what's going on in the universities because in the early 70s, as we've already said, this was the point at which uh, French feminism, deconstruction, structuralism, the attack on the canon, the death of the author were all coming in. And a whole generation of critics that very much overlapped with feminist critics and you know, included feminist critics were participating in that. It has been, it's a new thing for me and something very exciting and important for me to see something called can a feminist classic be an American classic because the terms classic, canonical, distinguished, best, important have been terms that feminists have not wanted to use. And the whole emphasis, especially in American literature, has been cultural work, let's not talk about values, good for whom, when we say is a book good, good for whom, we're only going to talk in functional ways. And I really think that the time has come for feminist criticism uh, in the universities to get up and fight along these ways and say, this is a great book. This is an important book. This is not simply doing cultural work. This is doing uh, national work, aesthetic work. This is a book that we have to be reading. And I think it's partly because we've abjured that, uh, abjured that terminology that we've kind of lost ground in, 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 in making the fight for the incredible explosion, as Rebecca was saying, the incredible explosion in women's writing over the past 30 years. Women in the United States have been the majority of readers and book buyers since at least 1852. That's the first time it's been noticed. This is a perennial fact of American literature. But I think there was a turn in feminist criticism that really didn't want to deal with having the majority of the readers, the majority of the people in publishing are women. In fact, the gatekeepers are women because we said we're not going to talk about, the, we're not going to talk in, in terms of best classic uh, distinguished anymore. Everything is wonderful, uh, and, and, and we're going to give that up. I uh, want to follow up partly on what Elaine said, um, and something which connects to something Marianne said, and also the um, really very grim history of American studies and American lit. Um, first of all, you know, uh, 
the early, the, well, the most influential critics um, of the American literary tradition, um, D.H. Lawrence, Classic Studies, um, you know, even Van White Brooks, um, you know, they were, C.L.R. James, for heaven's sake, later, they are all identifying, you know, great American literature and the American psyche, the fundamental one, as male. Um, Henry James, you know, launches the, well, Hawthorne, Henry James, through Henry, they launch the great attack on the women readers who are designated, a la what Marianne said, the women writers and readers, middle brow, popular. And I think probably one reason we feminists got so involved in cultural values doing the work was decades, centuries of <laughs> that kind of burden and trying to get around it and under it. Um, you know, in the face of all of this, here's what's great, here's what's not. No, Harriet Beecher Stowe can never be great. Good God, if you want to teach Uncle Tom's Cabin, you have to rescue the woman from Henry James and James Baldwin. Uh, <laughs> you know, good, good Lord. Uh, and we fight this battle over and over. And um, I think inside ourselves. Uh, you know, we're all sensitive about our taste, our judgment, anyone who's a literary critic is. I think we fight the battle inside, too. You know, is my judgment correct? Will this last? Um, no longer are we saying, a la Lily Briscoe, women can't paint, women can't write, but somewhere uh, the culture is still, has marked us or is still trying to mark us constantly with, is it really good enough? You know, what about those standards you grew up with? Are you just, the new favorite word along with um, political correctness, special pleading? Is it just special pleading for all your beautiful education? I, I was very moved by what Elaine Showalter said about the reading public is mostly female and has been for fiction since 1852, which is fascinating to me. Uh, when you consider that women are the ones who buy books in an endangered industry where most Americans do not buy a single book in a year. I mean, this is really shocking. But I do want to say that though a lot of the editors are female, the purse strings are held by males. And I cannot count the number of times when either as a fiction writer, as somebody trying to get poor dear Fear of Flying rescued for the silver screen, I cannot tell you the number of times women have said to me, we love your work, we love your work, we love your work, but the man upstairs decides what movies get made. The man upstairs decides what advances we can pay. The man upstairs controls the advertising budget. So while we have women's taste among the readership, and while we have women's taste among the editors, and while we have women's taste among the producers and the screenwriters, the purse strings in the media companies are not held by women. And when I think of the number of times that I've gone in with the Bible for a television show where all the women producers loved it or a script for a movie where all the women producers loved it and it went all the way to the top and some man said, I don't get it. And it didn't get made. Uh, women readers in Oprah's book club were made fun of long before John Newman Franz it. Women readers and women writers have been made of, yes. made fun of since 1852. Well, I mean, exactly. <laughs> women, there's the George Eliot essay, the silly novels by a silly lady novelist. Yes, and which, women will do women will do it too. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure very much. Serious. Well, and if you look at the, it's not the most recent flap over Chicklet, but um, there was a there was a lot of exchange in the press over Chicklet after I and I hope I get this right, Curtis Sittenfeld, who's a great young novelist wrote in the New York Times Book Review in a joint review of Candace Bushnell and somebody else, of course they were joined in one book review, um, that calling a woman's book chiclet is 
the equivalent of calling her a slut. And there was a lot of exchange over that. And, but if you look at the George Eliot essay, and I don't know what the date of that Eliot essay is. I'm sure somebody in this room does. Um, <laughs> but, Eighteen sixty nine. But if you read that essay, which is hilarious, uh, you know it's a great it's a great essay. But if you read it, you'll find pretty much exactly the same charges about what fiction is making men think of women's intellects. The same kinds of charges that we hear when we hear criticism of Chicklet and how oh, Chicklet makes men think that all women want to do is drink Cosmopolitans and wear high heels. George Eliot was saying equivalent things in that essay in 1869. Hello, thank you. My name is Dr. Mildred Polner, and I'm a, I teach at the City University of New York. I also make educational films, and the reason I'm telling you that is I've just come from a conference here at Columbia on Russia, where half of the audience were all young people. And I cannot uh, not state how different this conference is because so many of the people here are above a certain age, which is the same for me. And when I left that conference, which was over, I asked a young girl who was a major internet intellectual doing a postdoc on Transnistria, would she like to come with me to the conference on fear of flying? Her response was, what is that? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Judith Gerberg, and I'm not an academic. <laughs> uh, but I'm very curious, particularly from your point of view, Rebecca, uh, picking up on the point of economics, which is something that I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, we all have to immediately go out and see every woman's movie as soon as it opens, because that first weekend is determines when, uh, whether it gets picked up. But I'm curious about new media. I'm curious about uh, the impact of the internet on our ability to uh, reach our readership, reach our viewers, reach our, uh, our colleagues, reach other feminists. Um. Well, I can speak to that uh, a little bit. I work at an online publication, but I'm also kind of a Luddite. Um, I can say that when it comes to feminism proper, I have long felt, and I've been very up with young feminism. In fact, I mean, it's only recently that I've, I've been feeling as grim as Min is about <laughs> current femi feminism. Um, but for feminism as a political movement, the internet has absolutely given it new life. There are feminist leaders, and I don't know if, if people in this room are familiar with them or not, but like Jessica Valenti and Amanda Marcotte, who are young feminists who started writing online. Um, there are blogs, Feministing and Pandagon, and they get huge readerships, and they've, made, they've spawned other... Uh, uh, when I worked at the New York Observer five years ago, had I pitched an idea about a feminist, I would have been laughed out of the room. I moved to Salon, and was allowed to start a feminist beat, in large part because an internet readership was interested in women's issues, and I can't quite explain it, but in a way that, that readers of print publications weren't. And I can, the only way I can explain it is to say that it had to do with youth. Now, since then, print publications, The Observer now routinely writes stories about feminists and and women's issues. They, they have had reporters who've been assigned to that beat. Ariel Levy at New York Magazine and now at The New Yorker, that's her beat. She's fantastic at it. This is, it's, it's a, and I do believe that a lot of that comes from an online excitement. Much of the mail I get is from college students. So, and they, they have MySpace pages and blogs about women's issues. So I do think that in that regard, the internet has absolutely given new life to feminism. As far as the publications go, I can speak on one small subject, which is the political bloggers. As, as many of you know, there's a whole world of left-leaning political bloggers out there. I actually can't read most of them. <laughs> but for a long time, the assumption that, that, you know, people blog often anonymously, often in the first person, and the assumption about every single political blogger was that the blogger was male. 
And within the past year, I hope I'm right about this, Digby, anybody know about this? Uh, one of the major political bloggers came out as a woman. And it really was a coming out. People were shocked because the assumption had been that if you're writing about politics in a, in a wonky, serious, left-leaning way, then you're a dude. And the fact that this blog that people had been reading for years was actually being written by a woman was shocking to everybody. It was a big deal that she came out. Which book? Digby. Digby. Okay. I'm, yeah. Uh, hi. Well, I'm a, um, a male, obviously, and a serious, uh, a, a serious reader, and you don't have to buy a book. There are plenty of good libraries in New York, believe me. So um, I'm going to ask a question to put things in a general context, and I don't mean this at all to be derogatory, but for the panelists, if you think in the 70s and you think in terms of literary classics, no categories, fiction, what would be your not choice, but just one or two outstanding examples of what today is considered a literary classic from the 70s published. Just to put things in context, I'd appreciate your experience on this. Well, um, I'd say um, Maxine Hung Kingston's Woman Warrior, which I think is a masterpiece. Uh, Maxine Hung Kingston, Woman Warrior. I feel like I'm on a, show, a quiz show. <laughs> I think I, th I think it will. I think it is is already a classic and will remain. And it's a ma it is a ma I think it's a masterpiece. I, now I have to think. I know it's like walking into a record store, or a secret record store, a music store, and suddenly thinking, oh, I can't think of anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say that um, the bluest eye is a classic at this point. Yeah. You know, there is also writing, I do want to bring this up, by women from the 70s that is very interesting, um, strong, influential writing that I cannot say it was written by women who called themselves or thought of themselves as feminists at the time. Um, you know, as a journalist, I have quarreled with her a thousand times over the years, but I cannot deny Joan Didion's um, importance and um, interest as a writer, and I think some of her work um, is classic. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, before I give you my answer, <laughs> and, I, and I really want to co-sign with what's been already said, in the books that have been mentioned that are just terrific, I'm really interested in why you ask. Like, I want to know what your agenda is, and I'll tell you mine. <laughs> well, well, well first, of, first of all, generally, I, I don't read relatively contemporary fiction. I'm stuck in the 19th century, and... Uh, well, I'm with you, brother. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I wanted you to put it in context to sort of, uh, you know, get out of the, the labeling I, and, and to put it in the uh, literary in the broad sense, because I... I sense one of your frustrations in talking about this topics is that the the media or the powers that be push you people in a in a, a feminist literature corner, and you're trying to get out of that and, and make a case that there's a, a a bigger, stronger effort out there that should be recognized. If I if I've got it right, perhaps I don't. So I'm trying to ask you in a broader context, what would be literary classics? Just to educate myself. I'm not. Sure, that's good enough for you, but that's... No, I think that's a really terrific answer, and actually what's been interesting in my career and my career in terms of a post-publication is very brief because I published my book in May 2007. I'm new. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, every single one of my reviews, I've been compared to somebody pretty much in the 19th century because all of these 19th century writers were my models, frankly, in terms of stylistically. I write as an omniscient narrator. So people are always asking what my favorite books are, and I give them my entire litany of my 19th century, starting with George Eliot's Mill and March, which is probably my favorite book on the entire planet. So I'm totally with you. But I guess I put you in this spot because I think very often that kind of questioning is done to reduce us into a situation where we have to give you an answer which is a, a female 
censored um, author. And I can give you probably 10 of those things. However, what I think is interesting is very often I would like to see a situation where readers and intellectuals start to make peace about this issue. That it's not about ranking. And I have a 10-year-old son, and he went to an all-boys school in New York for a long time. And one of the first things that I noticed since he was four is he would say things like, well, Ethan is the fastest runner, and Griffin is the best artist. And it was really peculiar to me because all of his classmates who are boys would do the exact same thing with listing. And I think the comment was made earlier before by Elaine Showalter that we, as women, are hesitant to do that listing, to say that's the best one. And I think we do it because we understand instinctively and experientially what it's to be what it's like to be not on that list, to be con consistently put outside. And my personal hesitation to say, and I'm not hesitating with this point, that I believe Erica Zhang's book is actually an American classic, because I know that when I did my survey in terms of preparation for this work, and I did a lot of homework because I was really scared to come talk today. <laughs> Like, I read everything. <laughs> and for real, <laughs> my husband's like, that's a lot of work you're doing for that talk. And I'm going, there are going to be PhDs there. <laughs> and most PhDs think fiction writers are primitives. And they're right. <laughs> we just sort of paw through our feelings and start typing. But anyway, um, I did want to talk about this whole notion of listing. And it's a painful process for us because we haven't been on that list, and now you're forcing us to list, and that's the reason why I put you on the spot. I don't mean to interrupt. Make it, make it easy. I just ask for an example of a literary classic no, and, from and the you, 70s. And you got great examples, and you got great examples oh starting with I only got two. Today. <laughs> we want a Lots of, yeah, you know, there's lots. I'm not mentioning a male writer of the 70s. I mean, right. the gentleman asked for well, how about these by Thomas Pynchon? Well, that was the Wasn't that was before it? Uh, I, I don't know. Why are we doing a quiz show? I, I think we should. I think it's time to. Yeah, are there other questions? You need a reading list. No, 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 it's, it's okay, but I think that a really good way of answering the question is to, well, it wasn't strategic because I actually believe that that is a masterpiece, but when asked the question of what would you think is a great book, just if you give the a, a book by a woman writer, you don't then, you know, you're already destabilizing the question by just assuming that the possible answer to a question of what is a great book of the 1970s, and you pick two or three women writers without needing to label it or explain. It's, it's actually helpful in rerouting a question. Oh, okay. Um, that being said, I did one, quote I'm told totally there's room for, um, time for one more question oh. because the it's conversation with, with yeah. Erica John herself starts in like seven okay. I just want to say in relation oh. to um, the male-female thing, the flip the big fight. Uh, people are either right brain or left brain dominant. I'm, I did uh, research in Tavistock Clinic in England. I'm right brain, that means I'm on the feminine. So I'm in a world, you know, a lifelong fight for many of the causes that women have had. And I just want to say, uh, if you look at the literature, why did the Da Vinci Code have such a worldwide impact what does it mean, the coming in of the feminine? Are we at an evolutionary step right now? Uh, are we fighting a pederast mentality that's at the tail end? And I, I think that is what's happening. And I think you're going to see a lot of change in mentality, and it will affect literature and everything else. And you know, I leave you with the last question, which you don't have to answer. But was Mary Magdalene a prostitute or Jesus' wife? Thank you. I did teach uh, sitcoms, Columbia Theater, and Humanities class for two years, and I, 
I actually, I don't think that I'm very likely to teach it again, but if there was one thing that could make me do it, it would be the idea that as my optional book, I could add Fear of Flying at the end. It would seem to me a very uh, interesting twist. But I think there's sometimes a tendency for people to think that there's something paranoid or you know conspiracy theory thinking about feeling that uh, you need to stand up for the notion that these books written by women are classics. But I must say that every single year that I taught uh, in Lit Hum, in the fall semester, months away from the time when Austin would actually be read, some cluster of students would come to me and say, why do we read Pride and Prejudice in this class? That book doesn't belong with the other books that we read here. And if I asked, well, why doesn't it belong? They would say things like, well, Austin's name isn't on Butler Library. And it, it's really <laughs> extraordinary the degree to which uh, conversations haven't necessarily been as much affected by some of these developments that to many people in this room seem very, you know, I mean, unden undeniably paradigm shifting. But I, don't you think it's great that, um, that, that Erica Jong's books will be inside Butler Library, <laughs> even if... <laughs> I'll be, I'll be it. <laughs> they didn't make it, that wasn't engraved yet, but it's not lapidary. 